Hello and welcome to HR Profiles bi-monthly webinar series. Everyone tuned in today is in for a real treat, hearing from the president of Personnel Profiles, Mr. Paul Nolan, discussing what's the best way to hire, employment screening and assessments, know which candidate will succeed. If any questions arise during the presentation, please type them into the question box and we will go over all of them at the end of the presentation. Now, Mr. Paul Nolan has over 46 years in HR management, working for companies large and small. Having a master's in training and development, Paul understands that what makes a great company is more than the product you produce. It's about the people that produce it. And the best way to create that successful environment is knowing as much as you can about the people you hire. Paul has spent the last 20 years developing personnel profiles into the strong human resource consulting firm that it is today, with multiple locations helping small to large scale companies. Some you may have heard of, like Coca-Cola, Toyota, Goodwill, Federal Reserve Bank, Emerson Electric, and Siemens. These clients have found that the use of personnel profiles assessments has dramatically lowered their cost of recruiting, enhanced the quality of applicants, reduced turnover, and if that wasn't enough, they've also been able to increase employee productivity. Now, just as you wouldn't take a drug test to find out if you were pregnant, you would not give cognitive tests like math, reading, and critical thinking tests to determine if a manager will make excuses for his lack of performance. You have to remember, a drug test that is 99% accurate determining drug use is 0% accurate to determine pregnancy. And the same can be said for using the wrong assessment solution. Therefore, when working with your assessment provider, approach the conversation much as you would approach a visit to the doctor. Be prepared to tell them where it hurts and then allow them to ask a battery of questions to help pinpoint your issues. Oftentimes, companies or a client knows the what that is wrong, and then the assessment is used to uncover the why. Assessments give employers objective information that significantly enhances an employer's success in selecting the right person. Personnel Profiles helps by walking an employer through the entire hiring process, discussing what their options are when it comes to hiring, and what is the effective use of skill base and soft skill testing for pre-employment hiring. Paul Nolan will explain when to use the testing and how to decide what test is needed for each position. He will also focus on the legality and validity of assessment testing. So without further ado, here is Mr. Paul Nolan. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Paul. The floor is yours. Jane, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, as the slide says, I started Personnel Profiles 27 years ago, and the mission at that time was to find tests that could discriminate between good and bad performers. And it, it depends on what we're looking for and what we're trying to do is to what is the appropriate test to use in that situation. You know, it's so easy to rely on how they present themselves in an interview. And all of us would agree that resumes are, let's how we say, in many cases, exaggerated. Why is it we want to trust the person who wrote that resume uh, when we got them in the interview? There's an awful lot of tools that are out there right now that helps the, the applicant. Uh, last week, I Googled behavior interviewing. I came up with 4,370,000 hits on behavior interviewing. I then decided to take it a step further. I Googled beating behavioral interviews. I only came up with 603,000 topics. Some of them, five keys beating the behavioral interview. Next one, how to ace the behavioral interview. How to beat the toughest interview questions in my favorite Preparing for the behavioral interview, interview tips in video. Again, there's an awful lot of tools out there. And as I go through this on the testing, sometimes it says like it sounds like I'm against interviews and we're relying more heavily on the test. The opposite is true. Uh, what we're trying to do is test so that we get more good information to help strengthen the interview process. 
Sometimes applicants are chameleons. Uh, it's a little bit of a game where the applicant is trying to put forth the best appearance so that they get the job. Uh, and sometimes it takes a behavioral or personality test to be able to find out what the true core personality behavior is. I've got some clients that tell me that they've gone back to their personnel files and opened up the file and a year later have reviewed the test and said, well, this is really ex truly ex evaluated the individual accurately. And some of them have even told me that it takes 90 days for the test to be right. The applicants on their good behavior for the first 90 days, and after that 90 days, their core behavior comes out. One of the things you have to do in the, before you get involved in this is you have to set a target. We want to identify top performers. We want to look at your existing employees. As a general rule, we, we put them in the A, B, and C categories. A's usually represent about 20% of the classification. There's an old statement in sales that says 80% of sales happen by 20% of our salespeople. B's are average performers, and they typically represent about 60% of the classification. C's, 20% of the classification, but they present about 80% of the problems that you're going to have. There is a war for talent. You want, your job is to avoid hiring C's. You want to identify which candidates fits the best A's and what kind of training can we put together to be able to help our B's to be, look more like A's. But again, it all starts with a target. You need to identify what the, the A's look like. About 25 years ago, I put together this slide is what is the suggested hiring system. And it always started with the first interview and the assumption is I've got a stack of resumes, let's say 50 resumes, and I'm sorting through those trying to determine who I'm going to bring in for an interview, who I'm going to spend money on. Today, that first interview happens a lot by applicant management systems. Those of you who don't have an applicant management system, I suggest you talk to HR Profile about Galileo, their system. If you don't have one today, eventually you will have. Uh, it, it's a tremendous tool to help in the selection of candidates. But we're starting with the first interview. We've narrowed down the pool to say five candidates that we want to bring in for an interview. The idea is now we want to do the assessment test at this time so that I've got this information so that I can plan what am I going to ask in the second interview because oftentimes you're, you're not going to pick up those characteristics that you're concerned about from the resume. You need to get it from the assessment test. After you then have gotten down to your final candidate, I strongly recommend doing background tests and drug testing. And my choice for surprise providers for that is, of course, HR profile. And the final piece of the hiring pie is a training plan. We need to sit down and say, how do I take the star applicant and turn him into a star employee? We need to have a plan to get that accomplished. We want to identify, again, your top performers. And I suggest that whatever instrument you're using, you test your A performers to find out what, how they differ from somebody else. And we want to test them both on what we call hard skills and soft skills. And the hard skills might be, for example, we have some people that do mechanical comprehension tests. You might have a, a great brain and a great personality, but your mechanical skills might be limited because you just don't have that, that hard skill. So we want to know as much as we can about what our A applicants do, what is unique about these individuals so that we can identify the target that we're looking for. I call that standard, I call it benchmarking. You're trying to, again, determine based on where is the sweet spot, what are we looking for. If it's mental, where is the right mental test, the scores, sometimes being too bright for a particular job can be just as bad as not being bright enough to be able to handle it. If a study is not possible, if you don't think you have uh, a top performer or enough top performers, I would still recommend you sit down with the job description and you try to map out in advance what is the target that I'm looking for. Turnover is, is not necessarily a part of the, the testing thing, but I think at this point in time when we're talking A, B's, and C's, we ought to understand what the cost of the turnover is. If I look to the studies done by Harvard Business Review and the Wall Street Journal, 
when you have turnover for an A employee, it's three to four times the annual salary of that job. If you lose a B, it's generally one to two times the annual salary of that job. And when you lose a C, turnover is a positive. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to always be recruiting, always looking for an A. Hopefully you can replace the C with an A. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of tests that are out there uh, for, for different jobs. Uh, some of them are very good. Uh, trying to get a combination of mental and personality is, for most jobs, the, the best way to go with that. There's a whole variety of tests, and we're going to cover some of these tests and the strengths and weaknesses of them. Each of them has their place in what we're doing, and we'll, again, cover each one of these individually. <clears throat> Intelligent tests. They were generally developed to determine success for children in school. An intelligent test is a critical part, but by themselves, they're not great predictors of success or failures. we got some names of some here that you can see, general aptitude test battery. I'd probably throw Otis and Wonderlook in this category. Again, it's, it's critical to determine what is the sweet spot for this job. In other words, you don't want to put somebody who is extremely bright into a job that just is, is doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, you want to be something that, so the employee is challenged with it, but doesn't become bored and frustrated with it. Personality tests. Personality tests are looking to get the motivation and skills of an employee, and they can be adequate predictors of employment success. I would typically say in most cases, you want to add an intelligence test to this to be able to put the, the combination together. Some examples of those are the Caliper, Myers, Brig, Challey, Predictive Index, DISC. Uh, they can be excellent predictors. And when you have done a little workforce study and you're coming up with the right pattern, you're pretty much safe from any kind of uh, discrimination complaints. Courts have generally held that personality tests do not discriminate. There's also a job fit test. The good examples of that is the Achiever and the Guardian, which are two tests that I use. And I'll talk later at the end about the Achiever and show you how that works. Because it does mental and personality, and you do a workforce study that determines where the benchmark should be, they become excellent predictors. And this particular test in 50 years has never had a successful challenge. So that shows the legality for that one. Psychological tests. Psychological tests are, are designed particularly for high stress jobs, air traffic control, police officers. Uh, some of them are used by some employers, MMPI, 16PF. Uh, I caution you if you're using any psychological tests to check with your attorneys as they can occasionally have some problems. Target recently, not recently, a couple years ago, uh, settled a, a large lawsuit over the MMPI asking questions that were looking into uh, abnormal behaviors of potential candidates. So if you're going to use some of the psychological tests, and they're good tests, uh, I strongly advise you get counsel with your attorneys before doing that. Interest inventory tests are very useful in helping people make determinations as to what careers they ought to go into. We're, we're matching the, their interests and with people in other occupations. I've used the Strong, I've used the uh, Kreider, the Campbell, and I've used the Career Advisor, different ones. They're excellent in helping somebody decide what kind of career I should get into. Uh, one of the things that once somebody has determined they have an interest in a particular area, they should then do some investigating to find out what the earning potential is, is for, for that career, and then what kind of training do I need to get so that I can be successful in that. But as far as guiding people and helping make selections, it's used a lot by schools. It's used by outplacement firms to help individuals come up with new ideas as to where they can have a successful career. Educational tests are pretty much what we hear a lot of them. There was something in the Cincinnati Inquirer today about the different educational tests, a ACT, uh, the graduate record examination. They're like intelligent tests, but they're narrowing in on a very narrow area, and they're used by universities and typically not used in, in an employment setting. Another excellent test, work sample skill test. I like to call these the hard skills. 
uh, we're testing somebody's knowledge, for example, in word processing. They're designed to find out do you have the ability to do a particular task, be it welding. Uh, one of them that I use quite often is the NOCTI test. That's a family of tests. Uh, for example, if you want to find out if somebody is, is an electrician, they have a three-hour test uh, to measure that. Uh, and ex experienced electricians that have taken it have come out and said, I didn't know how little I knew because it tests all these different areas. I used some of these in, for Toyota in hiring building maintenance people. And I had a, one time a group of 30 people in a room, and they were going through the NOCTI test on uh, being building maintenance person. And when we walked out to a person, they all said they didn't realize how little they knew about their own occupation, even though they had 20 or 30 years experience doing that kind of work. So there's some very good hard skill tests out there. Another one that I use is the Bennett Mechanical Comprehension. It measures whether somebody is, can think mechanically. Uh, and it's an excellent test. And I'll have some employers that will say, oh, I've got a lot of conveyors and moving equipment. Mechanical comprehension is critical. Well, one of the things you need to do with any test is you need to do a, a, what I call a workforce study. In this case, we took, we asked the employer, do you have some people here that are in the job that you would call your A performers, the people you'd like to put in the copy machine and duplicate? And of course, they say, yes, I've got some. Well, we test them against the Bennett Mechanical, and we look at the results, and we're saying this is a great test, but it's not discriminating your employees because you got some people who score poorly on it, but they're good performers. So therefore, you don't want to use that test. And that same approach should be used for any test. You've got some people that are that are skilled. Run them against the test. You're testing the test to find out if the test can determine whether they're good or bad performers. That's a critical thing in any test that you use. Integrity tests are usually typical honesty. They talk about drug, alcohol, and theft on the job. Uh, there's a number of them out there. This is an area where you need to be careful. Some states, for example, Minnesota, Massachusetts, these tests are not legal to use in the initial part of the interview. So you need to check with your attorneys on that. But they're, again, looking at the person's propensity to use theft, alcohol, or drugs while on the job. They're called integrity or honesty tests. Uh, they can be very good and very useful. They sprung up long, just shortly after the polygraph became illegal for use in the uh, general employment section. Many of them were, were validated by doing the, the polygraph along with it. So they can be excellent uh, tests to help. The Achiever is, is one of my favorites. Uh, it was validated against the MMPI and the 16PF. Uh, the Achiever is not a psychological test, it's a personality test, and it's been out there over 50 years and has never hit a successful challenge or settlement over its use. It has, usually runs about 25 to 30 pages. It starts off with four pages describing the 18 items that were measured. It has a summary page, a score sheet, and I'll show you that in a second. It does, it gives a definition of leadership. And then based upon the individual score uh, on, the, on the achiever, it then strengths and weaknesses for leadership. Same thing with sales potential. It has the strong thing on the, on the interview questions. Anytime a candidate falls outside the benchmarks that we set in advance, it gives some training, it gives some interview questions to help you probe those dimensions a little more. And it also does development suggestions. It also measures things on the Bell population curve. It uses the stay nine, which is breaking the population down into groups of nine, with a one being 4% of the population, a two 11%, a nine 4%, and you've got 54% of the population in the middle. But the important, important thing is, what is our benchmark? Where is our desirable range? For some jobs, for example, in outside sales, we get to organization. Uh, two, three, and four is where the most successful outside salespeople have scored. If I were doing CPAs, it would probably be the other end of the page, seven, eight, or nine. Where is the cluster that happens with successful people? So no matter what test you're using, you want to determine the benchmark or the sweet spot for that particular job. Here's a copy of the score sheet from the, the Achiever, uh, and it lists the 16 things that it measures. 
Uh, and you can see on the, for example, mental acuity, which is a learning level, it's showing the individual score to four, but our benchmark was five to seven. So it's outside the range, and therefore we have suggested interview questions. It measures business terms, memory recall, vocabulary, numerical perception, mechanical interest, sometimes math, and it has 10 personality dimensions, energy, flexibility, organization, communications, emotional development, assertiveness, competitiveness, mental toughness, question improvement, and motivation. It also contains two validity scales to tell you whether you should trust the information you're getting from the candidate or not. This is an idea of a job fit test. Uh, this is one of my preferred, but again, I, we are independent and we, we have tests from a lot of different vendors, uh, which, which, which ones happen to fit the needs of the employer the best. But there's a lot of tests to select from and hopefully, you know, this information will help you along that way. Any questions? Uh, thank you for your time. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so assessments help you get the right applicants in the right seat on your company bus. <laughs> that was exactly. great information, Paul. So we can take a few minutes to cover any questions that might have come up. So let's see what questions we have. Okay, the first question is, how important is it to test all employees versus just the top positions? Well, you, when you're doing the testing, if you're, we're talking applicants, you want to have, if you want to group, you want to test, you make consistent, you want to test everybody in that group. So if I'm coming down and I've just got my five finalists for this job, I'll bring in for the interview, I want to test all five of those people. Uh, it is helpful sometimes to test all applicants. It tells you uh, which, which applicants are best to, to, to interview and which ones to avoid. But from practical standpoints, most employers are just selecting who they think the best candidates are. Test them in advance so that you, you, you know what kind of interview questions they ask. And in some cases, you know not to bring them in for an interview because of the test results. Right. <laughs> A great one. Uh, so next question is, how do we get rid of poor performers? those seeds. Can we use an assessment as a reason to let someone go? Absolutely not. That was the, uh, it would make the attorneys very happy and very rich in doing <laughs> something like that. Uh, you, it's still the old school. You have to document. And, and the, the idea of the testing is pre-employment is so that you don't get into that situation where you have to terminate somebody. But using the test to be able to, to get rid of people is the is a misuse of the test, and I can guarantee you it'll get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So you also during the presentation said that uh, the Achiever is the uh, test that you currently use. How long have you been using that as a job fit assessment? Probably about 26 years, uh, and it happens to be the one I like. Some of these other tests that are out there are very good. Uh, I mean, Divine, Chally. Uh, it, those are good tests. I sometimes would like to see uh, you use, along with those, uh, some kind of intelligence test to help get you the, the mental picture. Uh, one of the things we talk about with the Achiever is if you don't have the mental, you're missing two-thirds of the loaf. One-third is the mental, obviously. And another part of that is the correlation between the, the mental and the personality. For example, somebody who might be low in organization, it compensates the fact that their mental is, is quick. I can also tell you that I've done inmates in jail, and one of the combinations that they have, they are low in mental acuity, their learning level is low, and they're low in flexibility, which means they don't like to follow rules and regulations, and that's a, a formula for disaster. So sometimes getting that information in advance can, can save you a lot of grief later down the road. <laughs> uh, another question that came in um, with about Coca-Cola. Uh, if their questions, they want to know, do their questions include vocabulary and math questions? I want to know how that helps to see the candidate, if it will be successful in the position in addition to the situational and behavioral question. Well, it, it almost depends on what's the job classification. And if we're talking people working in a bottling plant, uh, doing the vocabulary is, is not something that, that the skill that they need for that job. So we would probably use a different instrument. In fact, I think they use the Guardian 
as an instrument that doesn't do the, uh, the vocabulary, but it does do the math. And again, what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at the A employees uh, and see on the, for example, on the Guardian that measures 15 things, uh, pardon me, 13 things. You're looking to see which of those 13 are significant, where the, where your A employees have scored in a in a pattern where they're, they're clustered together. If you got them on the scale of one to nine, if they're if they're scattered all across the board, that would be an indicator that 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 section is not able to discriminate between good and bad performance, and then you should ignore or, or not use that particular part. So if I gave a math test to some people in a particular occupation and found that very good employees, some of them were poor in math, that's telling me that math is not a critical dimension and therefore you should avoid it. One of the things that got a lot of testing people in trouble, uh, and the Bennett and the, and the Wonderluck were two that go back about 25, 30 years ago, they had serious EEOC problems. They were using it for all classifications. And the people were giving the Bennett mechanical comprehension test to receptionists. And it made absolutely no sense that the, the, the receptionist had to have good mechanical comprehension. It just was not necessary for the job. And therefore, they had all kinds of grief that they, they came from that. So whenever possible, to try to do a workforce study to make sure the instrument you're using can truly discriminate between good and bad performers. Mm -hmm. When you're setting those benchmarks to make those discriminations, how many current employees should you test? Should you just test the A's or should you test a variety of people in that position so that you can pinpoint what's unique about the A's? Well, we want to do the A's because we want to know all we can about why people are good performers. Uh, there's an awful lot of reasons why people are C's. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you do it, it's, there's useful information in the C's, but there could be just a thousand different reasons why they don't perform well. And again, what I really want to know is what is unique about the A's? It may be their education. It certainly could be their mental and personality characteristics. It could be something about their background, that we have a, a, a tremendous uh, success in hiring ex-military people. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you, you want to study as much as you can about A's, and you want to test as many of the A's as you can. If you've only got five of them, we'll test the five. If you've got 20, test the 20. The, the bigger the number, obviously, the better the study. But again, we're trying to get information about what works. I like to say the A's are the people we want to put in the copy machine, and C's are the ones we want to put in the shredder. <laughs> so we, we need to know what that target is. Oftentimes in a seminar, I'll offer somebody, I say, I'm going to give you a $20 bill if you can complete this task successfully. And I hand them an eraser, and I say, I want you to throw the eraser against the wall. And they'll heave the eraser at a wall, and I'll compliment them for their form. But I'll say, I'm sorry, that was the other wall that I was thinking of. You need to know the target. If you don't know the target, you can't hit it. In the UPS days, we used to say of measurements, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So but you need to get that target in your mind in advance so that you don't go into this situation and hire somebody because they interviewed so well. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people get interviewed. I've come back with some companies that we, where we've tested everybody that they've hired and I'll come back a year later, and I want to do an updated workforce study. I'm saying now you've hired these people. They've been on your payroll for a year. Let's go back and look at their test scores to see what's unique about them. And one thing that I find company after company, when I come back to sociability, communication skills, uh, they're hiring people that are on the seven, eights, and nines of communication because they interview well. Uh, and when we go back and we look at who's performing well, Who's, who's staying longer, we find that it's not the people that are high on communication skills, but really more of the people that are in the middle, that are the five, sixes, and sevens on communications and not the eights and nines. But company after company, I see this, the eights and nines are the ones that get hired, and they're getting hired because they interview well. That's the wrong reason when to hire people because they perform well. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, can you comment on the strength finder? Have you heard of that assessment, Strengths Finder? No, I don't know that one. There's a book, too, I think, that's on it. And it has, um, I guess, you take the test, and it has a whole bunch of different ones. But yeah, there's, there's, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of tests. And the unfortunate thing is some of them, uh, and then a consultant might make this particular test, 
and they, they'll put their name on it, and that's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen several of them where, you know, like this, and I, I get a copy of it, and I go, oh, I know what that is. That's this one. So it's, it's there's just thousands of tests, and I don't care which one, in many cases, you're using. If you're using one, congratulations for understanding that you don't always want to believe everything the applicant tells you. You want to make sure you've got more information. The more information you have, the better decisions you're going to make. You're going to reduce your turnover, increase your profitability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So um, there's someone that says, please review the scoring on the Achiever test to help me understand. So okay. Can we that back one? up there? Okay. Uh, it, it's done again on the stay nine basis, the, the one through nine. So we're measuring candidates against that. Uh, and then we set benchmarks, which, for example, in mental acuity, it's five to seven. That's the, the sweet spot that we're looking for. Let's come down to an, an easier one. Let's take energy. And that's kind of reversed a little bit. A low score in energy means I tend to be hyper. I can't sit still. I tend to be restless. Uh, and we have a four, five, and six as our benchmark. And the four, five, and six would be described as a self-starter, someone who, who's got a good energy level. And the eights and nines are somebody who tends to be calm. So if we're talking an energy, a one is somebody who can't sit still. And as the meter gets up, when they get over to nine, they really like to sit still. And they're comfortable with that. But it's going to vary by jobs. And let's pick on the Federal Reserve Bank customer. Federal Reserve Bank in downtown Cincinnati has security guards that sit in the front of the building and they're sitting there all day long and looking at video monitors. They're watching all the employees, but they're watching these. Their preferred score on the energy is eight or nine. They're able to handle that heavy sedentary job where they're sitting there all the time. They also have security guards that roam through the building and pop up at different times, and they're always moving around. Their preferred score is three to five for those particular jobs. So it depends on the job and where the benchmarks would be for that particular job, even though in their job classification, the security guard has got the same job description, but we know that there's some of them are, are different in what they're doing. Also, there have been some studies where I've done with the uh, people that are doing telemarketing, uh, and typically on the energy level score, they tend to score high because they're sitting behind a desk on the phone all day long. They've got to be able to endure that. So we want to say, what is our target, which is our benchmarks, and we pick up the benchmarks and, and we measure the person against that. And it, I brought this up, just it, there was another question. Uh, which test would you recommend for measuring being successful in a call center? Maybe we can go through this and... Well, and that, that's going to vary again by <laughs> what, what kind of call center. Uh, you know, and typically... Uh, I, I did a part-time call center one time where it was a pizza company, uh, and the mental acuity was not a critical dimension for that one. We looked at the eight performers, and the personality worked out. Uh, for the call center, uh, typically you're going to see higher scores in energy, which means they can handle that sedentary. They're going to have higher scores in emotional development. Again, they can be more tolerant. Uh, you probably need good assertiveness skills, so they have to close the sale. And moving forward on that one, uh, mental toughness, which is our sensitivity. Uh, they need to be a little bit more thick skinned because there's going to be a lot of rejection and criticism. Uh, questioning and probing, they're going to have good, strong skills there. Uh, but it's, again, what are, what are we trying to sell? Uh, when I did a, a, a group that was doing eye surgery. Uh, their scores were certainly different than the call center was doing pizzas. Uh, even though it, some of the job descriptions look similar, but it, it depends, and that's a, that's a waffle answer, but it depends on what the job is. For example, in the uh, call center for the pizza, mental acuity wasn't important at all. When I did the vision people, it was extremely important because I had to convince people not to be afraid of the surgery and, and the expense they were getting into, and I had to, I had to think quickly. Nice. Okay. Uh, do you know of any best test instruments for nursing applicants? Uh, probably, I mean, a personality test is going to be certainly critical. 
if you're looking at hard skills, I don't know of any, but I would be willing to bet you something like that exists. I know in the NACTI we can get into accounting and, and welding and, and electricians and uh, HVAC and a lot of other tasks. Uh, but offhand, as far as nursing, the hard skills, no, I don't, but uh, they're out there. <laughs> <coughs> All right. So we had someone comment about the Strength Finder, and the comment was that it teaches you about what your five top five core identifiers or beliefs are. Mm -hmm. uh, so like mine, when I took it, it was all about relating to people and having empathy and having uh, energy towards others. Yeah, you're, you're going to find a lot of the personality tests uh, all developed around the same time. Uh, we, we measure on personality a lot of the exact same things. Mm -hmm. They just put different names on them. Uh, for example, assertiveness is sometimes called dominance. Flexibility is, could be called character strength. So there's, there's different spins on them, to, and it, but a lot of them are coming from measuring the same things. It's just in many jobs, you have to determine, do I need the mental? Uh, in my days at UPS, we had uh, people whose job was to go into a trailer and pick up a package, put it on the conveyor belt, label up. And that's what you did for, for, for four hours. You picked up a package, you put it on the belt. Mental acuity was not necessary for that particular job. As a matter of fact, if your mental scores are too high, you'd probably get bored real quick and easy on doing that. So it, you know, it depends on what the job classification is as to what's the appropriate test. And sometimes it's a mix of things. Sometimes we'll throw in, for example, the Bennett Mechanical along with the Achiever or along with the Guardian because we might find that in our study that mechanical comprehension is critical. There's also tests to do with spatial relationships. Uh, and what kind of math is required for the job. There's different kinds of math tests that are available from simple arithmetic to, to complicated uh, word problems. So there's a little bit of everything out there. Again, critical, do a workforce study to make sure the instrument you're using can truly discriminate between good and bad performance. Mm -hmm. uh, would the, is it the NOCTI, N-O-C-T-I, NOCTI yeah. test? Be the correct one for hiring a manager of building and grounds? Uh, they would have some that would be very helpful for that, yes. As far as, again, we're doing the hard skills. Do they do they understand the, the maintenance activities that have to go on for that? Uh, that would be about a three-hour test, and yes, that would be very appropriate, uh, as would the, the achiever measuring whether they have the assertiveness to tell employees, uh, to, to manage the employees and go through that. Uh, again, it's a combination of hard skills and soft skills, but the NACTI people would, yes, definitely have tests that could help in that area as far as their knowledge. Uh, I guess a good example of that is with the Federal Reserve Bank. A couple of years ago, they were hiring an electrician, and the HR manager was very frankly said, I wouldn't know if somebody has good electrical strengths or not. Right. Uh, the NACTI test can tell you that. Now, do they have the personality, for example, manager, to be able to be assertive enough to hold other employees accountable and to help train and develop other people? That you get from the personality test, like the achiever. Mm -hmm. okay. So you get it's the hard skills and the soft skills. There's, you know, it, it, when we're doing outplacement and working with outplacement firms, they talk about a triangle. And the triangle is at the top of the triangle is interest. Do you have an interest in doing this? The second part is the hard skills. Do they have the technical capabilities to do it? And the third piece is the soft skills. Do they have the mental and personality characteristics to do it? I can tell you that years ago, I used to teach tractor trailer drivers. Matter of fact, I wrote training programs for tractor trailer drivers and, and used to, to drive them myself. Uh, I can do that from a hard skill. I can do it from a soft skill. But I can tell you, I have no interest whatsoever in doing it. But if you put the combination together, the interest, the hard skills, the soft skills, that usually indicates success. Somebody's going to be happy in that job, perform it well, and stay long term. Mm -hmm. And that's what we all want. Yes. All right. Why do validity scales have wider benchmark ranges? Extension, or example, the distortion is one to six. Well, it's measuring the actually actually. In, in reality, three to six is the only scores that the, the low scores that can happen. Uh, there's no ones and twos because there's no test that's perfect. Uh, and you know the seven, eights, or nines where we're starting to get into some distortion 
where the amount of questions, they've missed over half of the, the distortion questions that are out there. Uh, and, and typically, when we get down to equivocation, five is typically the highest score that you, we, we see that pops up. Why they benchmark developed a six, I'm not sure I got a good answer, except that we know that if the scores are six or lower on both of those, the accuracy rates of the test are acceptable. Mm, okay. Uh, on the Achiever test, are the blue numbers the sweet number? Yes. And then um, if an applicant falls out of range, like if their number happens to be you know, a 2, an 8, a 5, or out of the range of where those benchmarks are, you said that you give interview questions? Yeah, the test will automatically give suggested behavior interview questions. And I don't, I don't want to overcomplicate this one, but there's also correlations. For example, uh, I got a low score here on energy. Uh, which means I'm internalizing stress. Uh, I got a low score on emotional development, uh, which means I'm more impatient. I've got a low score on mental toughness, which means I'm more sensitive. That combination is an individual who's high energy but blows up under pressure. Uh, I've got a customer as a, a police department, and recently they were hiring some new police officers, and they had one candidate who interviewed very well. Matter of fact, he was their number one candidate that had that combination, low energy, low emotional development, and low mental toughness. And I told them that if they hired that person, I would not drive through their community anymore. Because you're not going to, you're going to give that guy who doesn't handle pressure, put a gun on his hip, uh, that's a that's, that's disaster waiting to happen. But again, the good instruments are going to give you some suggested interview because you want to probe into those dimensions a little bit more in the interview to get more information as to how this candidate is going to behave on the job. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not the test being a pass-fail. You're making the determination. The, the achiever or any of the tests that you're using is a tool to help you get more information to strengthen the interview process. Yeah, so you can identify what this, how this person will be. Exactly. Not just exactly. What they can say. It, it's like as we go down here and we're looking at communication skills. That's where I see so many seven, eights, or nines, or particularly eights and nines, of people that get hired. They get hired because they just interview well, and that's the wrong reason to bring somebody on board. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's a newly created position and you don't have any of those A performers or any benchmarks to follow, how do you decide which questions to ask to find a top performer for a new role? Well, we, we've done, it's Achievement Tech in over 50 years, they've done lots of studies, so we've got data from a lot of other companies. Uh, but typically, I'll start with that, that data, and then I'll start with a job description. And using the achiever, we mark down where we think the scores ought to be. Uh, and we can be relatively accurate, but the, the ideal thing is that we can get some existing employees. And then one of the things that I insist on uh, or ask customers to do uh, is a year later to come back and let's look at people that we've hired and see how they perform. Is that actually in our company, we'll do that study for free for companies to encourage them to come back and, and do that study again. I know I got one convenience store chain that we initially went in, set some standards, tested some existing employees, and we cut their turnover about 25%, which is typical. Uh, using a good assessment test to reduce your turnover. A year later, we came back and we looked at people that have been performing well on the job uh, and. We readjusted the standards, the benchmarks, and we were able to knock another 25%. So they're hitting right wow. now with 50% reduction in turnover. Again, we're using information, and that's one where it was really dramatic. And people they were hiring, they were they were the eights and nines in communications. They were people who just interviewed so well, but those aren't the ones who stayed and performed well. It was the four, fives, and sixes. Uh -huh. So this is another similar question to that. Does the Achiever Test instrument have standardized benchmarks that have been developed over time uh, that can be purchased either by job or occupation? Uh, yes, but again, I, I recommend still uh, let's look at the job description and let's see what you need. We might have a, a, a pattern for sales uh, and you're selling microchips and the study was done on buffalo chips. The customers are going to be different. The standards are going to be different. Uh, we can even get into a situation of a, a, a new car salesperson. Uh, and if I'm selling a, a Corolla or the entry-level uh, Toyota cars or I'm selling a Lexus, the scores of the salespeople are different 
because the customers are different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I try to avoid using off-the-shelf benchmarks. I try to say, let's try to customize. Uh, if you sit down and you talk to your test provider, understand they understand the test better than you do, and you understand the job better than they do. So if we put the two brains together, hopefully one and one can make three. <laughs> I like it. Well, that is all of the questions that we have for today. We have um, we're right on time, so you guys will still get your HRCI certificate. And uh, if you can see it in your um, control panel, I've got two handouts in there for you. One is the um, slideshow that you saw today. I will also be sending out a black and white copy for you uh, in your email by tomorrow to receive um, and that will have not only your HRCI credit, but also a copy of the slides, a recording of this webinar, and a registration link for our next webinar. Um, so thank you all so much for being here, uh, joining us today. Thank you, Paul, for presenting. Thank this you. was wonderful information. Uh, you know, great presentation. Uh, a copy of the slides, everything will be in your inbox. Make sure that you join us for our next webinar going to be on September 16th at 2 p.m. where attorney Janica Pierce Tucker of the Taft Law Firm, uh, she'll be presenting legalized and medicinal marijuana's potential impact on the workplace. This is a hot topic right now because legalization is coming up on many November ballots, so make sure that you know everything you can, again, about what you're going to be voting for and how it's going to impact your workplace. Oh, we do have one hand raised. Let me see. Dun, dun, dun. Pam. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll be reaching out to you, Pam, individually, just to make sure that we did answer your question or get everything taken care of. Uh, we look forward to talking with you guys again in September. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great one. Bye. Bye now. So Nancy said, thanks, very good program. Um, and then there was... You told me to slow down now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs>